Hi friends, and thanks for tuning in. In this video, I'll walk you through the basics of IP addressing in AWS, things like private IPs, public IPs, elastic IPs, and CIDR notation. This video will be more theory than hands-on, which I like to do on this channel, but I do think that understanding the concepts is really important, so let's go. Here I have an EC2 instance that I spun up, and you'll notice that we have a public IPv4 address, as well as a private IPv4 address. And I don't have one for this particular instance, but you'll also see a spot here for Elastic IP. So what does all this mean? I'm sure you've heard an IP address is like an address for a person or a house, except it's for a computer. And that's true. But I'm going to tweak that analogy just a little bit to hopefully make better sense of the public, private, and Elastic IP concepts. Using the example of a person, I think we can all agree there are several ways to identify a person. Things like nickname, full name, their social security number or other national identifier, email address, phone number, and so on. Well, the same is true of resources in AWS. There are multiple ways to identify them, multiple IP addresses. Sticking with our example of a person, a nickname would be a private piece of information. This is only going to be used by close friends and family, the private network, if you will. For an AWS EC2 instance, the equivalent would be a private IP address. This is used to identify resources on a private network within AWS. In other words, you can't reach it from the internet. If I were to go back out to the console and try to open up this IP address, I'll just copy this, the private IPv4 address, and paste that into a new tab. We could wait and wait and wait, but nothing's going to happen here. And you might also notice that unlike the public IPv4 address, which has this open address link, we don't have that on the private address. And that's because you can't open it from a browser over the internet. Back to our slide. For a person, a public piece of identifying information would be their cell phone number. Anybody can use it to reach you. But it is only temporary. In other words, you could get a new cell phone number tomorrow or next year or whenever, but it's public and anybody with a number can reach you using that number. In AWS land, the equivalent is a public IP address for your instance. This is accessible to anyone over the internet, with some caveats about security groups and firewalls and such. But if we go back to the console, and copy the public address now. Just go to this tab. You'll see the private address never loaded. We wouldn't expect it to. This is the public address. And we can get here no problem. I just have a simple web page on that instance. But this too is only temporary. This public IP address is assigned by AWS. And when you go to stop and start the instance, you're going to get a different public IP address. So not something that you can rely on to always be the same. For an elastic example, at least in AWS terms when it comes to addressing, this would be information that doesn't change. For a person, that could be a social security number or some other national identifier, depending on your country. This uniquely identifies you, and you'll have it for your entire life. For an EC2 instance, this is an elastic IP address. It's actually a static public IP that you can attach to the instance, and then that instance will always have the same IP. So hopefully that helps you understand the differences, but now let's talk about what all these addresses and numbers mean and where they come from. Which means we need to get into CIDR, but not that kind of CIDR. Here we're talking about classless interdomain routing CIDR. I refer to it as CIDR, some people pronounce it CIDR, I've even heard CIDR, but regardless, CIDR. This is a notation used for describing blocks of IP addresses. Back to the console. And specifically looking at the private IPv4 address here, the 172.31.5.253, this comes from a CIDR block that we assign to the virtual private cloud, the VPC. So let's understand that a little bit better. The humble IP address, it's made up of what are called octets, or groupings of eight bits, and there's four of them. At least that's true for IPv4. IPv6 is different, but we're not going to discuss that here in this video. To make it more clear, I have this example, 192.168.0.1. If you translate that into binary, you'll see those values here. And again, 8 bits per octet. Now, in case your binary is a little bit rusty, just a quick refresher on how we got all of these numbers on the top. I've copied that down and placed it over the values for binary. To do the math here, any bit that has a 0 can basically be ignored. So our 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32 positions, which just leaves us with 64 and 128. If we add those two together, we get 192. 
which is that value we have up at the top. For another example, we can move to the next octet. Once again, for math purposes at least, we can ignore anything with a zero on the top, and then we add up the remaining 1, 2, 8, 3, 2, 8, and we get 1, 6, 8, like we see above. So hopefully that helps to make sense of the binary and the bits and how they relate to the decimal numbers that you normally see used in an IP address. Okay, so that's the basic anatomy of the IP address and how we got those numbers in the octets, but what's this whole CIDR notation thing about? When something's written in CIDR notation, you'll see at the end a slash 24 or a slash 16 or 32 or whatever. And what that means is that the first 24 bits will always be the same, and the remaining bits, eight in this case, can change. So we're starting with 192.168.0.1, and then we're only gonna work with these last eight bits because again, the first 24 are basically locked. But we could change that very last digit from a one to a zero. Then we can move over to the second bit, flip that from zero to one. So now we have an ending of one zero. Then we could take that final bit, flip it from zero to one. So now ending in one one and on and on and on we go until we flipped all of the bits and we end up with all ones. So the very lowest address would be 192.168.0.0. The very highest would be 192.168.0.255. And that gives us a total count of 256 IP addresses, which is basically going from zero, inclusive of zero, up to 255, so 256 total. Let's do another example. What if we said slash 16 instead of slash 24? That means the first 16 bits will always be the same and the remaining 16 can change. And hopefully just intuitively, you can recognize that that means a lot more IP addresses with all those possibilities of 16 bits changing instead of just eight like we saw before. And it is a lot more, it's 65,536 to be exact. Which brings me to this point, which might seem a little counterintuitive, but the lower this slash number is, and this is called your subnet mask, the lower that is, the more IP addresses are available, and the higher that number is, the fewer IP addresses are available. So kind of an inverse relationship there. And you can see that here on the table, I'm including this for easy reference, but starting with the largest possible number for the subnet mask, the slash 32, this will give you just one IP address, or two to the zero. And there on the right, you'll see what that address is. Moving down to the very last value of slash zero, that means all IP addresses from 0.0.0.0, .0 all the way to 255.255.255.255 .255 and everything in between. And just a couple of other notes, I'm only showing slash 32, 24, 16, eight, and zero, but all of the numbers in between are valid as well. So you could have a slash 31 or a slash 17, something like that, but these are gonna be the most common here on the table. And also AWS does reserve some IP addresses, so not every IP in the range will be usable in AWS, even if the math says that it is. A really handy reference for you is a site called cider.xyz. Let me show you that real quickly. This site is really great for helping you visualize what I've just been talking about. It's a good one to bookmark and sort of play around with. But let's take that address that we've been using so far, 192.168.0.0, and we're gonna go with slash 24 to start. You'll see the first usable IP down here, 192.168.0.1, and then the last usable IP, and that gives us our total count of 256 IPs available. If we take this down to a slash 16, that means smaller number, more IP addresses. So there again, you'll see the first and last usable and the total count 65,536. So again, a great site to bookmark as you're getting started. Now that we understand a little bit more about CIDR notation, just a note here about what are called RFC 1918 ranges. This is a specification for private IP addresses, basically saying there's only certain ranges that can be used for private IPs, so we know that they don't conflict with public IPs. You can imagine the chaos that could ensue if everyone could use everything from public and private addresses. I've included the ranges here. For our purposes, the most notable is in the middle, starting with the 172. This is the range that the default VPC uses in AWS. Again, coming back to our instance, the private IPv4 address, starting with 172.31, that address is coming from the range of the VPC. 
And here I'm just using my default VPC if I open this up. 172.31.0.0 slash 16. So that instance is using just one of the addresses in that overall range. So that's it for this video. Hopefully it helps. Next time you're working with instances or VPCs, all of those IP addresses should make a little bit more sense now. If you want me to do some hands-on with creating VPCs and subnets and so forth, let me know below in the comments. And also consider subscribing for more content like this. Thank you so much for watching.